Today, I'm going to be debunking seven lies that the purity culture tries to propagate. Chances are you may have been taught these lies and maybe even still believe them. So stay tuned. What's up, guys? My name is Isaac David, and this is The Daily Disciple, where I help you follow Jesus daily. Today's video is brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. It's because of your guys' support that I'm able to continue to do this. You keep my ministry going and growing, so thank you. If you're not familiar with purity culture, be thankful, number one. But if you grew up in an evangelical church or maybe Maybe you were homeschooled or maybe you were just a you know Christian kid growing up in the early 2000s, most likely you've encountered purity culture material. You know, the motivation of purity culture didn't come from a bad place, I don't think, in large part. People saw the pr promiscuity that was going on and they wanted some sort of biblical response. So they started creating a lot of material about how to stay sexually pure. Books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye um, really convinced people and encouraged them that sexual purity is an important aspect of their Christian walk. I don't disagree with that at all. Unfortunately, there have been some progressive Christians that have seen purity culture as an opportunity to deny that we should have any sexual purity at all or strive for that, like God has anything to say about sexuality at all. That's not my stance at all, because I do believe that God has some clear things to say about sexuality. My critique is that Purity culture has gone about it in a very wrong way that has harmed a lot of people and has demonstrated some real lies that we as Bible-believing Christians, people that want to honor God with our sexuality, we need to confront these lies head on. Now, on to the lies. Virginity is your most precious gift. I've heard this so many times, especially directed at women, and I think it's from a good intention. Like, they have, they, they want women to value their virginity, value their sexuality, not just give it away to anybody so they emphasize hey it's your most precious gift unfortunately in emphasizing so much about virginity specifically they actually end up shaming not only sexual assault survivors but also people that have you know had sex outside of marriage before they became a Christian. They walk into church expecting to encounter the redemption that comes through Christ, but in turn, they're actually told this most valuable part of you, it can never be recovered, and you are less of a person. You are less valuable, and often it's emphasized less valuable to men, which is a very toxic thing to be perpetuating to women, but it's also like you are less valuable because you've lost this thing. It doesn't emphasize the redemption of our sexuality that is found in Christ. Like, I believe when we are made new, all aspects of us are made new in Christ. That means our sexuality as well. So all that past shame and baggage, that is all put at the foot of the cross. I think about what I want my younger sisters to be taught. And it's not that I want them to be taught, oh, virginity is your most precious gift. And if you screw that up, you are a piece of garbage. No, it's like God created you in his image. He loves you. You are, you are worth so much to him. I think that's where the emphasis needs to be. And in putting the emphasis there, I think we're going to help a lot of people that have either been victims of sexual assault or have made mistakes in their life and gone down paths they, they didn't want to go down or they regret going down. I think it'll help those people heal, both guys and girls. Second lie, men's lust is a woman's fault. You know, I said I grew up in purity culture. Well, my parents did a really good job at really guarding me and protecting me, and I think a lot of my siblings too, from these kind of harmful lies that the purity culture was trying to say and, and teach teens and kids. Um, but unfortunately, it's made its way into a lot of books, sermons, um, you know, teachings, and it's really not great and it's not biblical. When we think of Jesus, right? Like I think back to Jesus saying, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. It talks a lot about you, right? It's like if you look at a woman and you commit adultery in your heart, I think that's where the emphasis needs to be. Too often, I, I feel like, and I'm saying this as a guy, we're given um, an escape from what we should be taking responsibility for. It's a lot easier to say, and I'm going to talk about modesty in a little bit, but it's a lot easier to say, oh, it's this girl's fault because, you know, she's not doing what I think she should be doing or she's being prov provocative or, or whatever. It's a lot easier to shift that blame than to take a look at our own heart and say, wait, I don't have to look at women as sexual objects. I can actually see them as image bearers. I don't have to lust after them. That's not something I have to do. 
if I actually look at my own heart and, and ask God, hey, God, change my heart, you know, make me new. That's my desire. That ought to be our desire is guys not shifting the blame. Like, you know, this lie of purity culture that tries to get us to say, oh, it's woman's fault. No, it's like, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for this. And I want to, God, I want you to transform me into the self-controlled, um, dignified man that, that you can make me through your power and presence. That's who I want to be. And I think that's the message we need to be teaching guys. Number three is that modesty is only for women, basically, right? Like, we're not, you know, maybe you throw in there a little bit. Oh, it's for guys too, but we're talking about women here. Purity culture was huge in this, is talking about modesty. I've talked about modesty before, and I've talked about the the kind of the twisted nature that that a lot of these conversations around purity take place. They blame women. They say, okay, you need to dress this certain way specified way. You only got to wear dresses. You only got to wear skirts, whatever. Um, because at this point we're totally focused on guys, right? What do guys think? Are guys going to stumble? Um, but I think a lot of what, unfortunately, these conversations didn't address is that a guy can lust after a girl, no matter what she's wearing. Right. And I'm not saying that girls shouldn't seek to be dignified in the way they dress, but I'm saying that their attention should not be on other guys and saying, Oh, what does he want me to wear? What does, you know, what, what does Craig think, you know, is cool or, or how do I not make, you know, Jimmy, you know, lust because I got to wear this certain thing. It's like, no, how would God actually want me to dress? And that's how guys should be too, right? How does God want me to dress? So often we're like, so focused on the other, you know, sex, the other gender. And we're like, oh man, what do you know, what do they need? Whatever. And we need to actually refocus ourselves on God. And that's the whole like point with modesty, right? It's like, okay, it's not about the other person. It's about how would God want me to dress as an image bearer and, and um, not drawing attention to myself, being modest and, and humble. That's really the idea, right? Being humble in the way we dress. And the sad truth is because this conversation around modesty has been so toxic and man focused, um, a lot of women will just basically like deny the need for modesty at all or any like because they're just like, well, that's associated with purity culture and that's messed up and all that. And it's like, yes, I get it. But now there's all there's all this baggage connected to modesty where as a guy like I don't think you should dress for me. I don't think you should dress with me in mind. No, I think you should dress with how God wants you to dress. But honestly, when you do that, when you have God in mind, when you're focused on him, that benefits everyone around you, including guys, right? And so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful when somebody pursues God in their life and it just makes it easier to follow him. Um, but that's not where your attention should be. Your attention should be on God. And so uh, it's just sad to see the, the baggage that has been associated with this conversation. I'm hoping that in the couple years, like as time goes on, um, a lot of that will dissipate as purity culture becomes further and further in the past. And we can begin to have another conversation about what does biblical modesty look like? Because that's an important conversation to have. Line number four is that men are incapable of setting good sexual boundaries and women are it's their job to be the gatekeepers. As I was processing this lie and a couple of the ones to come, um, I was reading this book called The Great Sex Rescue. Um, it had some great counterpoints to a lot of the lies that purity culture propagates and was definitely an aid to me in making this video. So not only does this lie paint a very um, terrible picture of men, like we are just basically sexual animals who cannot control ourselves, we cannot control our sexual urges, and it is completely up to young women, because this is who it's targeted at, to fend guys off. And I mean, like, <sighs> there are a lot of guys out there, I know them, right, who respect women, who treat them with courtesy, who who value um, them as people and as image bearers, and who do set boundaries. And so when you paint every man to a girl, when you talk to a girl and you're like, every guy's going to be crazy like that. Everyone's like, I get this fear mongering tactic because you want your daughter or, you know, the girl in your youth group to be safe and you're teaching them. You're, so you want her to be cautious and, and be, you know, ready because guys are just out there, you know, wild, right? 
Um, but it really disrespects guys. It's really disservice to guys. And it's also putting a lot of pressure on girls. Um, I think the big thing with purity culture, man, is putting so much pressure on girls. They got to be like, okay, virginity is their, you know, most precious gift. They got to be modest and they got to fend guys off and, and know how to set good boundaries because guys have just no sense or, or courtesy for, for boundaries. Um, I just don't think that's true. Number one, and I don't think it's helpful to teach girls that. I think it's helpful to teach guys and girls both how to set good boundaries. Let's have that conversation. Let's have the conversation and how to respect each other and um, and less of this kind of like gendered like girls are the protectors of of the of sexuality and guys are like the the predators and there's basically this war going on. Like I don't think that's a biblical picture. And I just think it's an unhelpful picture. Line number five, and this one kind of blew my mind. I was reading that book like I was talking about The Great Sex Rescue, and it talked about looking isn't lusting. This is kind of, this might be controversial for some of you. I don't know. But when it hit me, it really, something clicked in me. I think there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of content. I made a lot of content around lust and like, how guys need to watch out and be sexually pure and like what you know and that's good i'm not saying that's a bad thing i think that's good right unfortunately and i've experienced a little bit of this is that kind of when you grow up in this kind of situation for teen guys especially you're teaching them well watch out for women basically right watch out for women you don't want to lust after them right teen guys um withdraw from a lot of situations where they interact with girls and they don't know how to talk to them or they because they just want to stay as far away as possible because we've kind of been fear mongering like, oh, man, you look at a woman. Oh, no. Oh, you might lost. Be careful. Like and I realize like I, I understand taking sin seriously. Like that's important. I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying kind of when you fear monger to guys like they're going to accidentally lust at every turn. They withdraw from women. And actually, instead of making important strides in learning how to talk to women and be friends with them and, and learn how to operate in those contexts, they withdraw. Also, um, it's okay. This might be controversial too, but it's okay to be attracted to somebody, right? That's not a sin to be attracted to women as guys. Like I'm speaking from a guy. That's not a sin. If you're like all of a sudden like that person's attractive. Oh my goodness, God. Like, oh, like, why did I do this? You know, like, well, it was me. Like, no, that's okay. That's just how you were set up. There's a difference between saying, oh, you know, that person's attractive and then or lusting, right? And I'm not going to spell it out for you, but I think you can, I think you can be any, you know, okay. I think you can begin to process the difference here. Might take a little bit, but it's there. And so, um, I just think this is a harmful lie that is taught guys that even just looking at women, um, is, is lusting and it just makes guys lives torture chambers. If they're constantly like, I can't even look at a woman, um, because who knows, but it's like, no dude, it's okay. Like, I wish I could go back and like tell my teen, like, uh, like 14 year old, 15 year old self, like who's like just paranoid about like, uh, like, cause I was like, uh, yeah, I like girls, of course. But it's like, uh, so I just got to avoid them at every turn. Like, well, you know, like who knows? Like, it's like chill. It's okay. Like you're going to be okay. Lie number six is that my sexual purity will guarantee a healthy relationship. Unfortunately, this is one of the most harmful myths, lies that has been perpetuated. A lot of people that have read, uh, you know, I Kiss Dating Goodbye have said, we we thought by doing what you said in this book or uh, books like it, that we would get a healthy relationship. And what they found out was, you know, their husband was um, totalitarian and was overbearing and maybe even abusive or um, the, the relationship was just toxic or whatever. Like it, just the fact that we, strive for sexual purity, especially in the dating phase and engagement. We're like, okay, you know, like there's so much emphasis on that. I think that's a, you know, it's good, right? Um, good resources. Um, but just because we, we do that doesn't mean that we are, um, guaranteed like God has to give us a healthy relationship. There are a lot of other factors that can go into a toxic relationship, create a toxic relationship. And I like, 
personally, I don't have a lot of the personal exam. People have been telling me these stories or whatever, but you can find a lot of them online. And, and it's pretty easy of, of just like, okay, you know, our sexual purity was in place, but what about all these other areas of the relationship that seemed to suffer? They weren't given that much attention. And so you're not guaranteed anything. We do, and this is the big, this is the big, like, I don't know, the big piece to this whole conversation is that we seek sexual purity, not because it's going to give us the life we always wanted. Or it's going to make we, uh, you know, us have a super healthy relationship that's going to be all fulfilling and all that. No, we seek sexual purity because that's what God has asked us to do. Why do we do what God has asked us to do? Well, because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were rebelling against him, he gave his life for us. Like, if you don't want to, if you don't love that person that would do that for you, something's wrong with you. If you don't want to serve that person that has given everything for you, like something's up. And so, yeah, we see that. We're like thankful. We're like, thank you, God. Now we're like, okay, God, wh what would you have me do? How would you have me live? And that's why we seek sexual purity. It's not because it's not this pragmatic like, oh, my life is going to be statistically better. Like even though people try to pull up those statistics, whatever, that's not the point. Purity culture lie number seven. It's either purity culture or sexual immorality. There's no in between. Now we can see, okay, yeah, there's purity culture, right? The early 2000s, it was really picking up. Everyone, all the evangelical Christians are really, you know, loving this content. People are cranking out great books on, you know, great books. I mean, I'm not necessarily great books, but you know what I mean? Like, okay, they're cranking out books on dating and courtship and purity and lust and all this stuff, right? And now there's kind of this shift where everyone's like dogging on purity culture, right? It's trendy. Like I'm making this video because I know, you know, people are interested in this topic, right? I'm not uh, naive to that fact, but it's really trendy to be like purity culture is terrible. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Purity culture is terrible. And now let's just throw out the whole Bible because it's all like just bigoted or whatever, or let's just throw out all conditions on sexuality because God's accepting of all kinds of sexual expression. Like, no, that's not the only two choices. It's not either like this kind of legalistic, um, pragmatic purity culture or this kind of like free, um, progressive, like sexual immorality, like whatever that is, right? No, it's like there's actually a biblical middle where we can teach people how sexuality was designed, how it ought to be conducted. Yes, within marriage. Yes, we ought to have boundaries. Yes, all of that. And and now we can strive to like debunk some of the the myths and the lies that have been propagated by both sides. I think there's two ditches here. And um and the goal, I guess, it's always the goal, right, is to find the truth and find where where Jesus would have us go. And, uh, and I think this is one of the conversations that we need to have. I don't think the answer is throwing out the Bible and saying every form of sexual expression is okay. And I don't think the answer is, well, we need to be really legalistic about, oh, you know, modesty. And like, you know, if you lose your virginity, man, you are not very worth that much. And nobody's going to want you as a husband. Like, like we get into the extremes here real quick. <clears throat> and I'm not concerned with being balanced. I'm concerned with being biblical. That should be always our, our striving. It's not about finding the middle of two sides. It's finding the biblical answer to the questions that we're, we're seeking. I hope this is the beginning of a conversation about purity culture and, um, and where we've gone wrong a little bit and trying to reel in some of the lies. Let me know your experience in the comments down below because I know a lot of people have different experiences. If you're not subscribed already, I would encourage you to subscribe and like this video if you've enjoyed it. I'm also on TikTok and Instagram at It's Isaac David and it would be awesome if you followed me over there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. God bless.